anyway. But today is also Sanctity of Life Sunday. And, and I just want to talk with that just for a brief few moments because we really need to be in prayer uh, over our nation as regarding abortion and Roe versus Wade. I mean, uh, over 900,000 children a year are sacrificed mostly at the altar of convenience. And, and that should really break our hearts. And I want you to know, ladies, if, you, if you've been through that, Jesus loves you. He will forgive you. Just embrace the love of Jesus. Uh, there are so many women who live with that secret and don't feel like they can talk about it because they will be shamed. Or I want you to know Jesus loves you right where you are, regardless of that decision. But I want us to be mindful of this in our nation. It is a, to me, it's, it is one of the greatest sins our nation has ever committed. Ever committed. When we fully embrace the killing of unborn children. And have progressed to embracing the killing of born children. At the convenience or decision of the mother. I mean, if you follow anything in the news, there are, there are places and government and through our nation and states that their leaders want to leave the decision, even after the baby's born, up to the mother to decide whether that child lives or dies. That's how far we have progressed or digressed as a nation. So be in prayer over our nation about this. We, we have a greater opportunity to minister to people. And even a great, the, 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 the greatest opportunity before us to possibly turn over Roe versus Wade. And we need to be people of prayer. We, don't, we need to be purveyors of life, not death. Amen. Jesus is life. We need to be purveyors of life. And, 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 and I'm using this to tie into my sermon because I think in... In the history of the abortion industry, it's always been about perfection. Because the founder of, of the abortion industry was profoundly racist, was profoundly about population control through abortion, and is still that way today. Her name is Margaret Sanger. Just do a search for her on the internet and you can find out. Look for legitimate sites. Don't believe everything you read or see that, that may pre predate her or post-date her, her death, read into what she really supported. She was, uh, she was into eugenics, genocide, and all that. And, and educate yourself about it. It's, it's a horrible, evil industry in our country. But I think un the underlying theme of that was perfection. Seeking perfection. And we do it today in, in other ways outside of, uh, of, of that industry because we have social media now and, and we have these devices in front of us that we, we can take any picture that we want. I mean, I want to turn the camera around. We're going to take a few selfies here. I'm going to take one here. and Oh, I didn't get that one. I didn't get you guys over here. Let me make sure I get you guys in over here. Yeah, smile. And uh, let me get over here, get everybody in so that, so that we, you know, smile real big now over here, this section. Can't leave anybody out. Because we got to get the perfect picture. And, and we'll go and we'll look. And, and everyone in here is guilty of it. Oh, that picture doesn't look good. Delete it. Oh, that picture. Oh, I've got to touch that up. Oh, have you seen the latest edit? Have you seen the latest filter on Snapchat or, or on your phone or, or any other device that you have to take pictures? We got to make our pictures look perfect. Because we can't accept imperfection. We can't accept flaws. We can't accept differences in one another. And in doing so, we continually perpetuate and seek out perfection. To the detriment of our own lives and, and on a, a larger scale to the detriment of our society and our culture. 
Uh, everything has to be said perfectly, correctly. They, there is no room for error. You're, you're swiftly rebuked if you say something that remotely sounds off-key, off-color. It's the cancel culture where if we don't agree with the person, they're automatically our enemy because my way, my thought process is the only perfect thought process that exists. That's how individualistic we have become as a society. Where our disagreements can't be civil, they have to automatically elevate to the civil war level where suddenly we are staunch enemies because we disagree. There were lots of people that disagreed with Jesus when he was walking around. There were lots of discourse about the reality of who he is, the reality of what he was doing there, the reality of his presence. Some embraced it, some didn't. But I think that even in that day, they were looking for perfection. And honestly, that was the only day that something perfect was standing in front of them. Now hear me, he's still here today, the perfect one. I'm just talking in the natural, in the physical, in the reach out and touch you kind of world. That was the only day, the only time that something tangible they could put their hands on that was perfect, that was perfectly created by God, out there to be able to touch was standing in front of them. And many of them missed it. Because they were looking for something else. Some other way, some other method, some other scenario, uh, whether it was politics, religion, what, you, you pick it. They were looking for something else other than what was in front of them. And sometimes, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify, most of the time, or maybe it's all of the time, whenever we have God in front of us, the answer is right there in front of us. If we... Do not accept the answer. It is not God's fault. We make a decision to not accept what is standing in front of us as the answer. My, my wife sent me a, a, a little clip of a, a, was it Kirsten? No, oh, Kirsten. She took a little Snapchat of her classroom that day. It was the mirrors. It had little mirrors on it. On the, on the bulletin board, because Kirsten is studying to be an early childhood educator, and she's doing some volunteer student teaching there uh, in Athens with one of the schools, and they had a big bulletin board with all these different mirrors on it. And, and the caption was, I want you to meet the person responsible for your attitude, your decisions, your anger, your frustration. And when you look in the mirror, you see yourself. It's not anybody else's fault. The blame game only goes so far. But it's in our pursuit of perfection that we make many, many mistakes and hold people to levels that they can never attain and that we, our own selves, can attain to the same level we expect others to perform. And I want to make a plug here because we've made a decision on February 1st we're going to as a church leadership we're going to be going through what's called the Acts 2 initiative and we're going to start learning and being taught and implementing the things that we learned there to help this church grow spiritually and numerically I feel this year is really going to be a clarity of vision year for us as a church we're going to see some things, and, and we're going to experience some things, and we're going to do some things that we're going to be able to look and say, yep, God's all in that. And as I, as I get further information about it, I will pass it along to you so that you will be informed about what we're doing. But you see, even in that, if, if we don't make a conscious decision, and we as individuals don't make an effort to make a decision to actually live out what we say we believe, it's just chaos. It's doing the same thing, the same old way, but expecting different results. 
if you haven't noticed, things have changed in our society and our culture from five years ago, from eight years ago, from ten years ago, from the big Y2K event. The, the end all of end all transitions was supposed to happen on uh, December the 31st, 1999. Everything was supposed to come to a screeching halt. The world was supposed to end. All technology would shut down and all the money systems of the world would fail. Well, it's 2020. They missed it. Now hear me, I was working in a manufacturing plant and we went to great lengths to make sure nothing happened in that event. If you were working somewhere at that time and you were around computers or any kind of electronic device that was connected in some way, shape, or form, your, your company probably took precautions to make sure nothing happened with that event. And what I want to talk with you about this morning is whatever it takes. Because in that event... Anyone who worked in those environments, the real mandate was, whatever it takes to prevent this from happening, we're going to do. Whatever it takes to prevent our plant from shutting down, our financial systems from, from shutting down, our whole world system of communication from shutting down, banks and everything, all transactions, electronic, whatever it takes, we've got to do to prevent it from happening. And I want to talk with you this morning out of Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And we're going to pick up. I think it's Mark chapter 8. I may be wrong here. That wouldn't be the first time. Nope, it is Mark chapter 8. Verse 22. In our pursuit of perfection... We, we, we have to change the course because I, I'm going to go ahead and pop everyone's bubble in the room. None of us in this room are perfect. None. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. There is not one person in this room that's perfect. Not one. And if you say you are, you're lying. You're unwilling to accept that there's a flaw in your life. I, I'm, everybody has a flaw, and it's one word flaw called sin. Period. So there goes all perfection out the window at the moment. But this is what the scripture says in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Then he came to Bethsaida. This is Jesus. And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he, and he was restored and saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answering and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders and the chief priests and the scribes and, and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke his, this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will it profit a man to give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. There are two things that occur in this passage of Scripture that I want to focus on. The first one is the blind man. There's much debate about why did it, if Jesus is really Jesus... Why did he have to do it twice? So therefore, Jesus failed in some regard. Because the first time he touched him, he wasn't healed. So it took Jesus two times. I've heard it preached, well, there's a, such a thing as a progressive miracle. And I believe there is. And, and, and Jesus was teaching a lesson and that's there. But I think there's a more common, a more natural, a more realistic view of why it took two times for Jesus to touch him. Because in that day, if someone was blind, they had an issue with their eye. And if, if you ever had pink eye or anything like that, your eyes get all matted together. And, and Jesus was doing, was, I mean, I, I, what would you do if someone spat on you and started rubbing on your eyes? I mean, some people gag at the thought of it. But, I mean, that's what the Scripture says. Jesus spat and spat on his eyes. I mean, and that's it. And touch his eyes and ask him a question. What do you see? And I think it was done twofold. One, because the spit was there to kind of clean the mat, the matted up stuff off of his eyes. So that he could open the eyes. So that he could accurately respond to what Jesus asked him. That wasn't the healing moment. That was the preparation for the healing. Because Jesus, I believe, did that because he wanted others to hear that man's confession that he really couldn't see. Because they could have just attributed it to, um, well, his eyes were matted together. We didn't know if he was really blind. And there's a, there's a great theologian that, that, that speaks of this same thing too. Adam Clark, yeah, I mean, he's an ancient theologian. That's... His thought processes line up with this as well. And where I saw things differently about this particular miracle, Jesus didn't fail at anything. Jesus did not fail at anything he ever did. Well, he didn't. He completely succeeded at everything he ever did. Even the cross, even the stripes. The thorns, the nails, the bear. He succeeded at everything that he ever did. And I believe that, that in this, he was preparing the others to be able to receive the miracle for what it was. Instead of someone being able to bring doubt. Well, you know, his eyes were really matted together. How do we know he was really blind? I mean, no one would do that, would they? No one would, would lie about Jesus. No one would lie about that, the presentation of that miracle? No, they would. Yes, they would. Jesus knew the heart of all men. He still knows all the hearts of men and women everywhere. And so he asked this question, what can you see? He says, look, I, I, I see men as trees walking. Meaning he had blurred vision. I mean, if you squint your eyes, you get things blurry. Or, or, or and, and what I, I like to do as a kid, I would like to lay under the Christmas tree. And, and I can take my glasses off because I can't see anything without them on anyway. So everything's blurry. I would lay under the Christmas tree and I'd just look up under the tree. And, and all the lights would just be these great little, pretty little globes, auras. And it just made it so nice and pretty. Kind of like they do that now with these, um, these pictures that are portrait mode. They make things blurry behind the... The subject, and, and even if there's a Christmas tree there, the, the lights just have this different glow about them with that, that blurred look. He could, that's, that's the way the man saw. And see, the man had to confess he had an issue. 
Now, his friends brought him to him blind. His friends knew he was blind, but the others around him didn't know anything about it. And I believe the reason Jesus used his spit was to clean the man's eyes off so the man could speak forth his issue. And then it says Jesus touched him again and he was healed. That was the whole point of the the episode. So that people would know Jesus really healed that man. There couldn't be a question about it. There couldn't have been an excuse made. Ah, uh, we don't know those people over there. They, they were faking it. They just rubbed something on that man's eyes to make him look blind. And they were faking it to make Jesus look good. Jesus didn't ask his friends of the blind man. He didn't ask the friends of the blind man, is he really blind? I mean, can he really see? I mean, when you go to the hospital, sometimes they ask your, your, your wife or your husband or, or, or your dad or your mom, well, what, what's really going on here? Jesus was not going to ask anyone else but the man that was blind. And the man who was blind was going to have to confess, I can't see. I see everything blurry. I see men walking as trees. They're all blurry. I can't see. And it says Jesus touched him again, and he saw everything clearly. Then as the, as the story progresses, Jesus changes gears completely by verses 34 through 38. And he gives this directive to take up your cross and follow me. And, and remember what, what, what I said about the year 2000 and, and doing whatever it takes to make sure that that event didn't cause problems. Jesus is really saying you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes to follow me. And see, going back to our perfection-obsessed world, we don't deal well with suffering. Whether it's ourself or someone else. See, the man in the story that was blind was suffering from blindness. He was suffering from a natural issue. And I think it's interesting that here we are talking again about Clearing up vision. And here we see Jesus healing another man who could not see. He had suffered for however long. And suddenly the glory of God was revealed through his suffering. But we have adopted this theology today, even in Christian circles, that we are never ever supposed to suffer anything we are supposed to walk around perfect we are supposed to walk around in complete and total health 100 percent of the time that we are never ever supposed to go through faith challenges that none of these things that we are supposed to go through we are never supposed to go through those and i take issue with that because it throws in the face of Paul, the apostle, when he beseeched the Lord three times to take whatever that thorn in his flesh was away and said, my grace is sufficient for you. So Paul, one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament suffered his whole life with some type of issue. Because we do not have a report other than what the Lord said, my grace is sufficient that he was ever healed from whatever that was that was buffeting him. I, I'm not concentrating on what was buffeting him as much as through the suffering that Paul endured health-wise or whatever it was buffeting him, God still used that for his glory. Because we are still studying the words the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write today. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, 1 and 2 Timothy. 
He's mentioned in the book of Acts. We study that man's words inspired by the Holy Spirit. And somehow we interpret those words as we're never supposed to suffer. I'm telling you, through suffering, God can do great things. But you see, the problem is we have to be willing to do what it takes no matter what the scenario is to follow God and to allow His glory to be shown through that situation. And those words for us are scary words because they they bring about all types of negative thoughts. I mean, if we really want to see our loved ones saved, are we really willing to ask the Lord, Lord, and mean it, Lord, you do whatever it takes to save my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, my best friend, my first cousin. And trust the Lord with it. No matter what they have to go through to get there. Do we really mean it? Well, I, I, I just don't want to see them suffer. Then you're not willing to do what it takes. Or what about your own life? My own life? What about when we say, Lord, I really want to know you. Like like Paul said, I want to know you. The the fellowship of your sufferings. Oh, everything but that, Lord. Everything but that, Lord. I'll do anything else you want. I just don't want to have to suffer any, any ill or any problems or any situations. I just want your glory. I'm going to tell you, you won't get the full glory without going through some things. And that does not always mean bad health reports, death and dismemberment. No, that means you might have to give up some of your favorite things. Some of your favorite hobbies. Some of your favorite friends. Some of your favorite websites. Some of your favorite radio stations. Well, I don't want that. You don't know what that's going to... You're right. I don't. That's why God wants to know, are you willing to do what it takes? To see His glory... Revealed in your personal life. You see, I'm, I've, I've reached a point in my own life, I'm, I'm ready for God to do whatever it takes for His glory to be revealed in my life. Whatever it takes. And I mean that. I've had a lot of time to think about it over the past week and a half and past few months. God's been dealing with me. I'm, I'm just ready for God to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Lord. I'm ready for him to do whatever it takes to turn this church around. That we would be a light, a beacon of hope. That we would reflect our community. Our, our, we would reflect Jesus. And, and that, that people would see us for who he is, not for who we are. See, that, that, there, there's, what do you mean for who he is? For who he is, not who you are. Because they're not looking for you. They're looking for him. You and I don't have all the answers. He does. And when they see Him in us, there we are able to point them in the right direction. And I, I like I, 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 don't, I liked it because I really don't have anything to do with it. Except say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And if that means give up myself to you, that means give up myself to you. If that means give up my dreams to you, give up my dreams to you. It it means I'm willing to do whatever it takes so His glory can be revealed. And I'm not talking about floating across the the, the congregational floor here and and, and making everyone go, whoo. No, I, I just want to know the Lord. I don't want to run across the top of these seats. I don't want to run around the the church yelling and screaming. I just want to know Him. I want you to know Him. 
I want us as a body to want others to know him. But we as individuals have to come to grips with sometimes there's going to be things in our life that we don't like. There's going to be events in our life that we don't really want to have to go through. But you see, that's what builds our faith going through those things. And, and that's why I believe that, that God does not remove everything from us when we are born again. He leaves things in our life that we can trust Him with, thereby building up our faith, and then our lives become pleasing to Him because Hebrews says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if everything in our life was completely removed, we wouldn't have the need for faith in our life. And, and thereby our lives would not be pleasing to God because we're not living by faith. We're living by our own mind, our own way of thinking, and not trusting God with it. That's that be willing to do whatever it takes, Lord, in my life, in your life, for His glory to shine forth. So that our identity is changed. That we're not seen as Stephen or Dylan or Charlie or, 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 or anyone else. That people really see something different about us. And that something different is Him. Because as good looking as you think you are, they don't want you. They want Him. Because He looks better than you. He's stronger than you. He's more capable than you. He has answers that you don't have yet. But if you're willing to let him use you, you can give answers to people that you never knew were inside of you. Because you've surrendered your life to him. And see, sometimes it might mean you need to get up an hour early so you can spend a little time in prayer or reading the word or, or doing a devotional. Instead of just getting up at the last minute... And I'm telling you, nothing annoys me more driving down the road. And, and, and hear me, ladies, I'm not just picking on you. If you do this, I'm not, but it does annoy me. Seeing somebody put on their makeup driving down the road. That is the most annoying thing to me that I drive through. Because they'll sit there at a the red light not even knowing it's green and backing up traffic for half a mile. Because they didn't get up early enough to put their makeup on in their house. Get up early enough to put your makeup on. Because you're endangering other people's lives. And your kids will thank you for it when you're not in a wreck. Because they want you around. Guys, you shouldn't be looking at your phones. That's an annoying thing for me too, but thank God that's against the law now. Texting while driving. But we, in our pursuit of perfection, even in that we're willing to do whatever it takes to get that Makeup on. Get that last little text in driving down the road. We're willing to risk our whole life jeopardizing our family and our kids' livelihoods because we didn't get up early enough or we can't resist the urge to send a text. See, in order to grow in the things of God, Jesus says it this way. Whoever desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That really doesn't mean a lot to us today because we don't crucify people anymore. Because we can't really in our own minds comprehend the violence that's involved in, in that event. So wh whatever we can equate that to to giving up, because what it really means is you've got to be willing to die. That we can all understand. That we, everyone in the room, at some point in time, our days, our minutes, our seconds are going to be up. And everyone in the room will physically cease to exist. Those who have made a decision to follow Christ will continue on in eternal life. Those who have not chosen to accept Christ will continue on in eternal death. Because there is no life. Outside of Jesus Christ. And the life will be found for those who are believers in heaven. And the death will be found in those non-believers in hell. And it's eternal death or eternal life. 
we're willing to risk more for our own personal pleasure than we are for our own eternal destiny. And Jesus said you've got to be willing to die completely every day and follow me. And follow him. That means we've got to be willing to let ourselves, sometimes our desires, our wants, our dreams go to follow Jesus. Well, that's not fair. God doesn't play fair, folks. I'll just tell you that right now. He does not play fair. He plays to win. And he always wins. He has a perfect record of winning every single time. He, he's the only truly undefeated person in all of eternity and all of time. Completely. And you're right. He doesn't, play, he doesn't have to play for it because he's God. See, we, we, do, we have developed this mentality where, God, this is my calendar. You've got to plan your activity in my life around my calendar. When it should be, we plan our, our calendar around the activity of God. And, and that means there's things that's going to be inconvenient for us to do to get involved in the activity of God. I mean, my wife and I, we, we, when we were like you, sitting in a church, we served in our church. We planned our lives around what God was doing in our church. Meaning, if Vacation Bible School was July the 12th to the 17th and we were going to be involved in it, we planned our life around those dates. And as best we could, we didn't let anything interfere with that. Sundays was off limits for us to do really anything outside of church. Unless it was really something important, we were at church, both services. Not because we felt obligated to, because we were wanting to be there, first off. Second, we didn't want to miss what God might do. And then when Jen's mom passed, we thought for a minute, did we, did, did we spend too much time at church and not enough time with mom, with Grammy? And ultimately we said, no, we got exactly where we needed to be. Because Grammy's with Jesus. See, we all, there, there's that seeking of perfection and having the perfect relationship, the perfect amount of time, the perfect this, the perfect that. And, and, and it becomes to a point where everything has to be perfect and we're unwilling to accept anything less than perfect. Thereby, we're unwilling to accept any suffering, any sacrifice, any commitment, any inconvenience that may come up because it's all about me and my time. Well, the last time I checked, God didn't have, to my, have my permission to do anything. And he doesn't have to have your permission to do anything. But he does say anyone who desires to come after me. If your desire is to follow after God. If your desire is to grow in your relationship with him. If your desire is to understand him more clearly. If your desire is to understand his word. You've got to be willing to deny yourself and follow him. Through anything that life throws at you. Because once your flesh figures out you're following the Lord, your flesh is not going to like it. Your flesh is going to act up. Your flesh is suddenly going to become sleepier every Sunday morning. Your flesh is suddenly going to become, oh, I'm going to get really tired on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Because I just got to get my sleep in. Go to bed earlier. Well, you, I, that means I might have to give up my favorite TV show. And your point is, if any of those things fit into our life that we really want to grow in the things of God, we're going to have to go through some things. And we have to be willing to do whatever it takes to get there. I like it how Paul puts it together in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 6 to 11, it says this, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But listen, to this he's going to start talking about us now, but we, believers. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. And then he goes through this little dissection of things, of life's issues. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Did you get that? We're hard-pressed on every side. That means that life sometimes is like a pressure cooker. And we can either let the pressure cooker do its work and produce something Edible, something enjoyable, something that's fit for everybody in the room, or we can let it destroy itself and us. See, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We scratch our heads and I go, man, what in the world is going on? I'm not going to be in despair, though. I'm going to trust God. How can this be happening in my life right now? This was not, I'm perplexed as to what's going on in my own life, in my own body, in my family. But I'm not going to get into despair about it. Then he says, persecuted, but not forsaken. See, when we have developed this perfectionist attitude and we think, well, no one should be persecuted today. And that's a noble thought. But as long as there are people who follow Jesus, there will be people who are persecuted. And hear me, I'm not segregating us out as the only people who are persecuted because there are others. I'm talking about the body of Christ. If you, if you as a believer believe that the body of Christ is never supposed to be persecuted, I don't know what gospel you're reading. I don't know what preacher ever told you that, but... You're not reading the right gospel, and that preacher was lying to you. Because Jesus himself said that in this world you will have the same word, persecution. But, don't despair, I've overcome the world. Written in red letters. We sang the song about thank God for the red letters. Maybe we ought to spend more time reading those red letters. Instead of trying to listen and apply what somebody else tells us about them. And just be like blind sheep walking around, seeing everything blurry, seeing men as trees, instead of having clear vision. Just, just a thought. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. Even if we give our own life and we are struck down to the max, we are not destroyed. You're not destroyed even if you give and you say, Lord, whatever it takes, even if it's my own life, you're still not destroyed. Paul was martyred for everything he believed in. And we are still talking about him today. What are we doing as Christians to leave a mark in someone else's life that after we're dead and gone, they'll still talk about us? Just a thought. Then he says, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Meaning that even if we go through suffering, the life of Jesus can be manifested in our mortal flesh on display for everyone to see. Much like that man that was blind. See, Jesus might be, might be asking you today. He might be spitting in your eye today. Not to be offensive, but to clear some things up so that you can confess just how blurry things really are. And then when you admit that before a holy God, He will touch you and restore your sight. Spiritually. Spiritually. I mean, I've, I've been wearing corrective lenses for 44 years. 
Started wearing them when I was 10 years old. I have asked the Lord numerous times, Lord, just give me my vision back, make it 2020. And I finally quit after about 10 years worth and just said, God, whatever, you, you know, I can't see, but if you can use me, I'm willing to be used. I mean, I've got corrective lenses. I, I can see when I need to. I've just learned when I don't have my glasses or my contacts in to kind of visualize where things are. So if I need to get up in the middle of the night, I can move maneuver around without any assistance. I know where things are in my house that I can get up in the middle of the night. I never turn on a light to see. I just walk through my house without my glasses on and get what I need to get. And see, maybe, maybe Jesus is the vision you need instead of your own vision. Because Jesus was the only vision I needed in, despite my lack of natural vision. And see, even Paul had an issue. He had scales that fell off of his eyes after he had his encounter with the Lord. Maybe it was that was his issue that the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. Or maybe it was something else. But the significance of that is that scales came off of his eyes. Suddenly he was able to see, not just naturally, but spiritually. Don't get hung up on the natural part. You get hung up on, God, I want to have clear vision spiritually. And that comes with what Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him daily. Then skip down in that same chapter of 2 Corinthians 4, and we're going to go to verse 16. Because the encouraging part that Paul's saying to us here is, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even in all those things, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction. Paul calls all that stuff light affliction. We get our toe stumped and don't get immediate healing. We're suffering. Somebody laughs at us because we pray over our food at Burger King. Oh, we're being persecuted. No, you live your life for God no matter where you are. No matter what you go through. Don't lose sight of the prize. You keep your eyes focused on Jesus and let Him deal with the consequences. For our light affliction, it says, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, when we are willing to do whatever it takes, we can see into the unseen realms of the heavens to what other people can't see. As Jesus said in the model prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. See, the only way that we can see what God is doing in the heavens is to have clear vision into the heavenly realm. And that's by starting by having a willingness to do whatever it takes to follow Him. The question I have for you and us today is, are you, are we willing to do what it takes to follow Him? Are you? Are you willing to say to Him, have thine own way, in my life. We, the, the song sung years and years. It's an old hymn. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. We don't mean that no more in the hill of beans. We don't. Because if we really meant that song, we would be different. If we really meant that song, whenever he puts his hands around our clay, our earthen vessel, and he starts shaping it and conforming it and transforming it, and it starts to hurt a little bit, we don't like that. We would be different. Whatever it takes in my life to bring glory to your name, do it. Are we really willing to say that? And I give caution here. Don't say that flippantly. Don't say it out of an emotional moment. Don't say it out of, well, the pastor says that's what I should do. I should do. No, you square it up with God. You talk to the Lord about it. Lord, I need to know. 
You get to a place where you can trust him and say it. Whatever it takes to deliver me from this addiction, this torment, this lifestyle, this pain, this hurt, this anger, this frustration. Whatever it takes, Lord, to deliver me from do it. Are we willing to do that? Whatever it takes to set me free from my past. Whatever it takes to save my husband, wife, son, daughter, mother, father, brother, sister, best friend. Whatever it takes, Lord, I lay them at your feet and trust you with them. Whatever it takes, Lord, to change my desires so that they line up with yours. Whatever it takes for the healing to come. Do it, Lord. Those are just some statements that I can't... And they're questions that everyone in the room can probably relate to. There's probably some that, that, well, you didn't think about this. When you did, then maybe that's something you need to talk to the Lord about. I don't know. All I know is, if we think for one minute we're going to peruse through life and never have to go any, through anything, we're believing in a false gospel. Because I've not known, read about... Even in the scripture, someone who were willing to give their life and say to the Lord, whatever it takes to bring him glory, do it. And them not have to go through something. Even some to the point of death. And, and somehow we, we, we have come to, the real, or come to the thought process that, you know, if, if God is loved, then I'm just supposed to accept everybody and, 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 and completely condone. No, 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 no. You love them. You let Jesus deal with them on their issues. You know, I'm, I've got a shirt on the way, and I'll bring it. I'm going to wear it one Sunday morning, and I'll show it to you. About, my daughter wears a love thy neighbor, and then it goes through and lists what kinds of neighbors that we're supposed to love. It's not, it's not my responsibility to judge them. It's my, it is my call and duty, as is yours, to love them. It says, love thy neighbor as thyself. And everybody in the room loves herself. I mean, you can lie about it all you want, but you, know, you think you look pretty good. In the dark. Until you cut the lights on in the morning, you walk in the bathroom and go, whew, where'd them bags come from under my eyes? Oh, I got a wrinkle. Oh my gosh, it's a gray hair. Yeah. I wish. That's a good one, Frank. Frankie wishes he could see his good gray hair. And then Jesus says at the end of the day, for what profit? What profit? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And I'm going to add this as my own emphasis. In position, in influence or status. And loses his own soul both in this lifetime and in eternity. What profit is it? If we gain all the influence, all the power, all the money, all, all that we could ever accumulate and want in our life, and we, in the end we lose our own soul. Because we were unwilling to do whatever it took to gain that relationship with the Lord that we should have. Are you willing today? Because if I remember what he said to Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient. My, my strength is will be made perfect in Paul's weakness. The strength of the Lord will be made perfect in your weakness, in your struggle, in your hurt, in your pain. And it all starts with one word called surrender. And it's another great hymn that's been sung for decades and decades that we really don't mean. We, we just sing it because it's the right song to sing at the end of a service. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. And we have gotten so familiar with it, we don't mean it when we sing it. It's really a prayer. And you know what? Sometimes God takes us at our word. And then when he has the audacity to quit, well, I thought you said you surrendered all. What do you mean? I was just singing a song. I didn't, I didn't mean that song. The song's really written as a prayer. Are you willing 
to do whatever it takes to bring him glory. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking you, Lord, right now in a, in a mighty way to reveal yourself, Lord. That, Lord, whatever it takes, your grace is sufficient. In our, our weakness, Lord, your strength can be made perfect. You did it for Paul. I know you will do it for us. You're that faithful, that great of a God. You're that amazing of a God. You're that strong of a God that, that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is impossible for you to do. Father, I pray that we are willing people as individuals and as a church, God, to let you do whatever it takes, Lord, to bring you glory. And that we genuinely mean it, Lord. That we're not just saying it because I preached on it or because they've heard it in the past or it's some kind, as some kind of gimmick. Lord, I, I'm, I'm praying, God, that we really, really mean it if we say it, Lord, whatever it takes to bring you glory. Even if we have to be drugged through three knot holes backwards to bring you glory, that we would be willing to do it. Even if it means that we excel in areas of our life ahead of our peers just to bring you glory. Even if it puts us in an audience of people that don't really like us, God, but we're there to give witness to who you are. Whatever it takes to bring you glory, Lord. That we change our calendars around to match your schedule and not expect you to match ours because you're God and we're not, Lord, whatever it takes. And that we have a desire to follow you whatever it takes and I'm asking you to do it all right now Lord start something new I, I ask you Lord to do something big in our midst today and I'm, I'm believing you to do something big in our midst today Lord start something new and fresh in our lives today in Jesus name I pray amen you and amen you stand to your feet moving in our midst we need to move yes we do I worship you I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship If you come to the altar today and you need me to come pray, just give me a signal and I'll come pray with you. Otherwise, I'll leave it with you and the Lord. In this place, I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. You can be your way maker God. today. That is your miracle you worker, are. your promise keeper. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship. I believe in some way he has touched every heart. In I worship you. You are here. Are you going to answer that knock? Healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Turning lights all around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, bending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep 
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.